Good day, everyone. On behalf of Acting Director Tracy Troutman and the staff at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, let me welcome you to the Smart Policing webinar on the benefits of collaborative policing. We have a sizable audience for this webinar, so thank you all for your interest in our work and in this very timely topic. My name is Chip Coldren. I'm the Managing Director for Justice Programs at the CNA Institute for Public Research, the Director of Technical Assistance for the Bureau of Justice Assistance's Smart Policing Initiative, and I will provide the introduction for today's webinar. We're pleased to have Kate McNamee with us today. Kate is the Senior Policy Advisor at BJA, working with us on the development and delivery of training and technical assistance for smart policing. Kate, can you offer some welcoming rem remarks, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Chip, and good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of BJA, I want to welcome you to today's webinar on collaborative policing. And by way of background, um, the Smart Policing Initiative has invested a significant amount of resources in, to, in developing, communicating, guiding principles for law enforcement agencies that are looking to adopt evidence-based practices. And certainly community collaboration and partnerships have always been um, a, a tremendous part of those principles. Um, we view them as central to success, we always have. Um, but the importance of cultivating these partnerships has of course come to the forefront for all of us who work for or with law enforcement agencies, especially over the last four years. And the national ongoing conversation about how best to do so led us to hold a series of work workshops um, gathering smart policing sites together uh, to discuss, you know, the best practices, promising approaches and challenges surrounding collaboration. And this webinar is one of the first products to emerge from those events. And, and I have to say the conversations we had at the workshop were exceptionally thoughtful, honest and innovative. And much like the national conversation underway, the discussion was not always an easy or comfortable one. But to me, that meant we were doing it the right way and not avoiding the hard issues that demanded attention and, and debate. And we plan to produce many resources based on those conversations so that law enforcement agencies can benefit from the ideas and promising practices uh, that were highlighted so stay tuned uh, for more from us on that in the coming months. And I would be remiss if I didn't send my thanks out to all of the jurisdictions that provided their insights um, and their participation um, in those workshops. Uh, and to also thank Chip, Vivian, Hildy, Zoe, and the rest of the CNA team, as well as our friends over at LISC um, for their work. In, in putting those workshops together and in participating in today's webinar and to also our presenters um, for sharing their expertise and time with us today. So thank you very everyone and I'll turn it back to you, Chip. Very well stated, Kate, thank you very much. So as Kate in, in indicated, today's webinar focuses on one of the foundational principles of smart policing, collaboration. Collaboration is something that we value and discuss frequently in our work. With this webinar, we will bring some clarity to the concept and provide some very practical approaches to how collaboration between police officers and community members actually works, even under difficult circumstances. And I'll join Kate in saying how proud I am that this webinar is one of several positive results from this series of regional community police and collaboration workshops sponsored by BJA last year. We did do these workshops in collaboration with the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is the technical assistance provider for the BJA Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Program, and with the COPS office. The workshop participants included a blend of law enforcement and community representatives. So at least we practiced what we preached. We collaborated. And we feel the product is better as a result. Perhaps that's the theme for today's session. Three of our colleagues will present this webinar today. Hildy Thizow is a consultant in Arizona and a long-standing senior subject matter expert with smart policing. 
She was one of the primary movers behind our collaboration workshop series. She will introduce key collaboration principles. Jason Cooper is a senior program officer at LISC. He too and several of his colleagues were contributors to the workshop series. He will discuss the role of police in what is called placemaking. Sandra Espadas is a representative from the BCJI program in San Bernardino, California. She will discuss her collaboration's work on crime reduction and economic development. Inspector Bill Barrett from the Brooklyn Park Police Department is the coordinator of the Brooklyn Park Smart Policing Initiative. He will discuss Brooklyn Park's unique application of collective efficacy as a collaboration approach and the impact it is having in the community there. Following these presentations, we'll have some time for questions and some dialogue. We are especially grateful to our presenters and we thank them for contributing their time and sharing their experiences with us and for working with us on putting this webinar together. Please honor their sincere effort by offering your perspectives and experiences or asking questions of them. This is one in a series of webinars sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and coordinated by CNA for the Smart Policing Initiative. We thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for its support of smart policing and the smart suite approach to justice system improvement, a range of technical assistance resources and opportunities for agencies implementing and researching smart strategies and tactics. The Bureau supports state, county, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies in many, many ways, and we are grateful that they do. Permit me to make just a few other comments. There will be opportunities for questions and participation toward the end of this webinar, so please make your thoughts and questions known. I can assure you that others will appreciate hearing what you have to say. Following the webinar, you will receive a request to evaluate it. Please complete the evaluation, and please give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. And please let us know what other topics you think we should cover on future webinars. Now, let me also thank Zoe Thorkelson and Vivian Elliott at CNA, who do the background work to make sure these webinars go smoothly. Let's have Zoe go over a few technical details, then we'll turn the webinar over to Hildy. Thank you, Chip. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Chip mentioned, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the webinar, so we just wanted to make you aware of how you can ask your questions. Uh, the first option is that you can uh, ask a question in the chat box. If you don't see the chat box on the right side of your screen, at the top right side of your screen, there's a button marked chat, and once you click that, you'll see it appear. You can send your questions to me on the host account, Smart Policing Initiative, and I can ask your questions aloud for you, or you can ask them directly in the chat box. You can also unmute your phone when we get to the question and answer section and jump in with your question yourself. We do ask that you please keep your phones muted during the presentation itself to minimize background noise, and we also want to make everyone on the webinar aware that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel after the webinar is completed for those who aren't able to join us today. Thank you everyone for joining us, and Chip, I'll pass it back to you. Hildy's eyes out to get us started. Hildy? Thank you, Chip. Hi. Welcome to this webinar on police community collaboration. We are really excited to talk with you today about what we consider cutting edge work in collaboration. Now, people have talked about community policing for decades, but what we're focusing on here is what we consider the next paradigm, an enhanced and refined version that we call collaborative policing. Now, last year, as you've heard, CNA organized regional workshops to explore collaboration and to identify best practices. Both police managers and community members attended the workshops and offered up a host of learnings and success stories. So to help police agencies and their communities integrate these learnings into practice, we developed a framework based on seven key principles, which we'll review over the next few minutes. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. I'll be describing the seven principles of collaborative policing. Then you'll hear from my colleague, Jason Cooper, who will talk about the role of police in placemaking. 
Then we'll hear two success stories in collaborative policing. One from a smart policing agency, the Brooklyn Park Police Department, and one from the San Bernardino BCJI site. So let's get started. I'm going to begin by describing just what is meant by collaboration. Now collaboration is a form of community interaction, but the most complex form. So if you think of community interaction as a continuum, as you see up on your screen, then community outreach, which is on the far left of the continuum, is the least complex. It focuses on information sharing and communication with the public, but it primarily involves just one way, all police-driven communication. Press releases or drunk driving campaigns are good examples. Consultation, though, is further down the continuum, and it involves not only information sharing, but also stakeholder input and buy-in. Town hall forums and community meetings are good examples. Now, coordination goes further down the continuum. It involves several agencies or organizations working together to share information and resources. And good examples um, are drug or violent crime task forces. But now, collaborative partnerships go even further. They bring together both police agencies and community members to address issues or solve problems by sharing responsibilities, resources, and decision making. The power of collaboration is in the sharing and the inclusion of stakeholders, which not only adds value, gets buy-in and trust, but results in more long-term and effective outcomes. Now recently, a new construct has been added to the continuum called collaborative policing. Now this approach combines the critical elements of collaboration, problem solving, and evidence-based policing with community partnerships. Now I suggest that you consider where your agency fits on this continuum and where you are now compared to where you'd like to be in the near future. As I mentioned earlier, out of last year's collaboration workshops, came a set of seven principles, which you see here on the screen. Now, police agencies can use these seven principles as a guide to help strengthen and integrate collaboration into their organization's culture and everyday actions of officers. These principles really build on one another. They impact the police organization by focusing on leadership, orientation, and training. They impact the work of individual officers by focusing on relationship building and work in diverse communities. And they impact an agency's communication strategies by focusing on how and what information is sent to and received by community members. Now what these principles and collaborative policing achieve in the long run is greater community trust, support, and cooperation more community involvement and ownership of public safety issues, and in the end, an improved quality of community life. So let's get to the principles. Number one, build a strong leadership support for collaboration. Now this means police executives need to identify collaboration as a key principle of the department's mission and values and they should promote and model collaboration at all levels of the agency, starting with the chief of police at the top all the way to sergeants on the beat. The department should also provide opportunities for community input and oversight through things like advisory boards and complaint review committees. Principle number two, orient towards service. Now the orientation of both the officer and the agency provides the context for collaborative policing. If officers have a helping and service-oriented mindset, what we typically call a guardian mindset, then they see themselves as protectors of the community. Now to build a workforce with this kind of mindset, agencies need to structure their recruitment and selection processes in a way that promotes the hiring of effective collaborators. This means dispelling outdated perceptions of police work when they're recruiting, you know, those macho ads we often see. 
They need to identify candidates with the skills and interests more in line with collaborative goals, and the agencies need to focus on diversity in hiring. Now, at the agency level, a service orientation encourages police to work more with community-based service providers. Such collaboration leads to really non-traditional solutions to some difficult problems like substance abuse and homelessness, issues that officers face probably every day, but on their own have little ability to make a difference. Principle three, transform training with collaboration as a key focus. So both for recruits and in service, police training should be reconfigured to build the skills necessary to support collaborative policing. In particular, there's a need for sophisticated and extensive training, not just a short three to four hour block, on officer skills in, in a number of key areas social interaction, communication, empathy, de-escalation, procedural justice, implicit bias, collaboration and problem solving, and evidence-based policing. These issues and skills really have to be a part of training, even if this means reducing emphasis in some other more traditional areas of training. Principle four, build community relationships. Now, what we heard at the workshop, both from police officials and community members, was that no practice is more vital to policing than the building of positive relationships with the community. And in order to build and support these relationships, there are certain types of communication and activities that officers simply must embrace. Things like regular face-to-face -face contact with community members and stakeholders. Just being ad hoc about these things doesn't work. Being good listeners. Truly listening is so important, not just being one-way communicators where one person does all the talking. Engaging people in an honest, caring, and empathetic manner. Now, we heard this over and over again, the importance of officers showing the community that they care. These are the cornerstones to building positive relationships. Now, a particular problem-solving approach that is very powerful and requires positive relationships is multi-sector collaboration. This is where police departments partner with private, nonprofit, and public agencies to proactively address problems, usually the really complex problems like mental illness or opioid addiction. Working with community-based service providers enables the police to get help for people like drug treatment or mental health services or job training, rather than simply depending on jail. Principle five, proactively engage with diverse communities. Now building positive relationships and trust with all the various people and groups living in the community, no matter their race, ethnicity, religion, or background, really requires focused strategies. For example, learning about the history and culture of community groups before policing them. Now, departments may want to openly acknowledge some past injustices perpetrated by officers, as a Georgia chief of police just did in the last few weeks, or acknowledge poor living conditions in the community where crime is high and history is still fresh in people's memory. And what may be particularly helpful in building relationships with youth who are so skeptical of police these days, are frequent small group conversations and police youth dialogues where people really can get to know one another. Principle six, improve communication and messaging. Now we also heard at the workshops just how communication strategies, if used effectively, can be powerful tools in promoting community interaction and positive relationships. Even your organizational brand should integrate the concept of collaboration. So a key question you might want to ask is, does your agency's mission include the word community or the concept of community service? Social media in particular provides amazing opportunities to humanize the police, 
to push out information the community cares about, to get accurate information out there, particularly in emergencies or crises, or just to share everyday stories of positive police work. We're hearing more and more about how agencies have thousands or even hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. Principle seven, understand community perspectives. Now it's important for police to understand and perhaps adopt the community's perspective. This means taking the time and investing the resources to learn about community perspectives on local issues. And this can be done in a whole variety of ways, uh, from surveys to focus groups to community meetings to town halls, even informal street corner sessions. The point is that these methods give the community a voice and the police a greater understanding of community priorities and, a, and also a sense of the impact of crime strategies, you know, those unintended consequences and a grasp of the community's trust and, con and confidence in the police. However, once you ask people for their input, it's so important to report back to them. Let them know you considered their input and perspectives and how that information was used. So another consideration. I've talked a lot about the police role in, in collaboration. But collaboration also denotes great responsibility and action on the part of the community because they're in it together. In fact, police and community have to be equal partners in collaboration work. So what exactly does equal partners mean? Well, we've spelled out the, community, the community's role as well. Things like what you see on the screen, identify leaders. The community can identify those leaders who have the credibility and the support in the community and should be talking regularly to represent the community with the police. The community can provide input on things like officer training curriculum and the impact of crime strategies. They can participate with police in problem solving projects. They can define public safety and neighborhood priorities from the community's perspective. They can support positive police work and recognize officers who do good collaborative work. They can help identify and sort of define those criticisms of police that we're hearing so much about and help problem solve the issues. They can ask police to share information deemed important to the community. You know, nudge the police along to provide the results of citizen complaints and use of force investigations if that's what's important to the community. And they can provide access to key community leaders uh, from the faith-based community, immigrants, youth, business, et cetera. So with that, let me introduce our next presenter, Jason Cooper, uh, with LISC, to talk about the role of police in placemaking. Jason? Uh, thank you, Hildy. So the reality of this work is that the police alone cannot protect neighborhoods from crime and also the idea of collaboration is a hard concept to implement as coming together with different organizations and residents and businesses and competing self-interest and coming together to, a, to form a common vision is never an easy pursuit. And in fact, many of the social problems that influence crime lie outside of police expertise. And one-dimensional approaches have proven in the past harmful to the relationships between police and the communities they serve. For example, the strong emphasis on fighting crime for two decades and the dramatic increases in incarceration that resulted tore a hole in the social fabric of many neighborhoods and further exacerbated tension on the streets Communities of color in particular suffered when aggressive and indiscriminate police tactics were used and failed to bring peace and stability, often leaving the feelings of those tactics being considered intrusive, oppressive, misguided, and race-based. So when I think about what all of this means together and what it means for collaboration, it makes the case that multi-sector collaboration is not just a principle, but a necessity. 
Multi-sector collaborations can reshape the physical, social, and economic environment by generating social capital and bringing together diverse and sometimes antagonistic elements of a neighborhood together by asking them to take a collaborative role in addressing issues and challenges in their neighborhood. And this is happening at the neighborhood level across the country through what's called placemaking initiatives. For those not familiar with placemaking, it's a concept that's people-centered, and it's an approach to the planning, design, and management of neighborhoods. Put simply, it involves looking at, listening to, and asking questions of the people who live, work, and play in a particular community to discover needs and aspirations. This information is then used to create a common vision for that place, often referred to as a neighborhood plan. So when people are collaborating, and I specifically wanted to talk to the role of police joining these placemaking initiatives, the idea of collaboration implies shared decision making, and Hildy referenced that the idea of collaborative policing is an equal partnership. So some tips for helping out with those collaborative equal partnerships that we've seen through the BCGI program and through some of our work as LIST is first to be transparent about the ultimate balance of authority and who decides what and when. Uh, two, think about who in the community needs to be at the table beyond the usual suspects. Very often when initiatives are deployed in communities, uh, either task forces are formed that are made primarily of religious figures or uh, leaders of different community-based institutions, but often they don't get deep enough to the people who actually are impacted by the work that's happening. So thinking strategically about who's missing and who should be at the table. And then third, identifying points throughout the collaboration when partners need to be included in decision making. Very often people are brought in at the beginning and at the end, um, which very often is too late because the meat and potatoes of collaboration really happens in the robust conversation about what the needs are and the analysis of what the proposed solutions are. So it's important to be clear about at what point are the decision-making uh, elements and where can we include our partners in that. And collaboration also recognizes that while arresting offenders must remain a central strategy of the police, efforts to revitalize neighborhoods and strengthen collective efficacy will ultimately produce larger and longer-term benefits than increased enforcement efforts alone. And we see the success of this happening in both BCJI and smart policing initiatives across the country. You'll hear some specific examples in just a moment. But I wanted to share some of the research that's coming out from Dr. Craig Uchida from Justice and Security Strategies that's showing that in areas of high collective efficacy, we're seeing crime is low. And that actually applies to micro places too. So as you can see on the diagram here, the yellow area is the area of lowest collective efficacy and where you're seeing more of the activity versus the more darker hues, the purple, the pink, and the red, where we're seeing less uh, criminal activity. And this is about over a six-year span. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over back to Hildy or Sandra. Okay, I'll just introduce our next presenter, one of our effective collaborators we wanted you to hear from. Sandra Espadas is a subject matter expert with the San Bernardino BCJI. Go ahead, Sandra. Thank you, Hildy, for that introduction. Um, I will also add that um, I used to oversee the BCJI program in San Bernardino, California, and was actually hired by one of the cross sector partners, um, Hope Through Housing Foundation, to continue some of the neighborhood revitalization efforts that I will be talking about today. So with that, um, I'll just jump right into the presentation. Um, I will start by saying that there were a lot of challenges with the BCJI grant, um, but with challenges also come opportunities. Not only did the city file for bankruptcy right after the award was made um, to the partners in San Bernardino, but council members, the mayor, the city attorney were all recalled. 
um, and the police chief also left right after the recall. So um, it was very tough to get the buy-in that we were uh, able to move the project forward. The opportunities that this did present to, to us during the implementation phase of the grant was um, the fact that there was an affordable housing developer that was leading the redevelopment of an outmoded World War II public housing complex um, right across uh, the way from where the BCJI program target area was located. In addition to that, there was another uh, partner housing entity that came connected to us um, as a result of us wanting to tackle some of the issues related to vacant homes. And they actually were a neighbor works affiliate. So as you can see from the map, the target areas of these three entities overlapped. And soon thereafter, this group began working together, focusing on place, applying for grants, and leveraging resources for larger impact. So this collaboration resulted in the formation of the NTC, which stands for the Neighborhood Transformation Collaborative. And with resident input, seven priority areas for the target area were identified to ensure the implementation of a comprehensive community development strategy that would address the various socioeconomic issues that have been entrenched in this community for decades. Some of the early wins um, and early accomplishments of the cross-sector partnership included um, working together to give the community small wins that would help gain their trust. This included police and residents and businesses um, organizing beautification projects along Blythe Street lots, um, organizing movie nights, and providing opportunities for uh, positive engagement. Um, we were also able to engage the local university in helping a local business uh, create a mural that really captured some of the historic marks of the community. These small wins assisted the cross-sector partners and the police department to build a positive working relationship with residents. The use of social media and traditional media sources were also used to bring attention to these wins and it was actually well received by the police department um, and it helped with their morale during tough budget cuts that were being made due to the, bus, uh, to the bankruptcy um, state of the city. So as the project moved forward, the NTC partners began working with residents and businesses to really understand their concerns related to the seven priority areas. We held various different workshops where we asked residents and businesses and other local stakeholders about what they care about the most and why, but also what they would like to see in their community. The two concerns that were mentioned the most were crime and economic development. Not only were residents not feeling safe in the community, but many believed that there were specific locations that allowed criminal behavior to take place on their property, which prevented them from shopping local or even walking along the commercial corridor. They felt that if these businesses were eliminated and legitimate new businesses would be placed in, their, in that location, then they would feel safer and the community would be safer in turn. So the problem businesses that were identified by the residents were actually located right um, across the street from each other. One was a donut shop and another was a liquor store. Residents shared with us that they never shopped at these locations due to fear. These businesses are always busy at all hours of the day and the night. And shootings at these locations are very frequent, uh, again, at all hours of the day and night. So given that, these issues, that the issues in this community um, were many, um, this information from residents really provided the NTC with some direction on where we should be focusing our efforts. With the assistance from LISC and the city and other NTC partners, a commercial corridor consultant was hired to help us identify a plan for the commercial corridor. The commercial corridor conducted, consultant conducted a, a day visit where she met with various of our partners and she analyzed the commercial corridor area of the NTC. I won't go into detail on all of her report, but if you're interested, I can share that information afterwards. 
But one of the key points that resonated with the city when she presented her report was the traffic count. So she identified that in any given day, we have 40,000 combined vehicles that pass through this intersection. This is why a Walgreens is located at the opposite corner from where these problem businesses are located. And this really showed the city um, an opportunity, an opportunity to really attract uh, a real legitimate maybe uh, business. So she did also share that Dunkin' Donuts moves in at 20,000 vehicles. And so this, this was really attractive for the city of San Bernardino. So the report that she did was actually done last year. And it was presented to the city uh, around this time last year. And since then, we've been leading monthly meetings with various city departments to implement some of the programs uh, that she had recommended in her report. That included a business thought program, a micro enterprise program, and both were actually funded um, in December of 2016, sorry, um, through the use of CDBG dollars. In addition to her rec these recommendations, she also recommended that enforcement operations at these two nuisance businesses um, should begin, and um, they're currently underway. And um, you know, we we have information that one of the businesses might uh, be evicted fairly soon. So on on top of that, we around the same time uh, we were working with one of the NPC partners on a specific plan. This plan um, was adopted also by the city in December of 2016, and as a result of this partner being connected to the BCJI program, they were able to expand and include the commercial quarter of the BCJI grant as part of a, their specific plan. For those of you that aren't aware of, of a specific plan, it's basically a planning and zoning document that provides development guidelines for a particular area. Now, the partners are now working with the city to organize the developers forum to inform potential developers of the various opportunities that exist along the commercial corridor and attract new development to this area. And we hope that that developers forum will be held uh, in a couple of months. So with that, um, I will answer any questions um, at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Let me introduce now uh, our next successful collaborator, Inspector Bill Barrett with the Brooklyn Park Police Department to talk about the Smart Beaching Initiative and what they've been able to achieve in terms of collaborative policing in Brooklyn Park. So Hi, I thank you for that. Hi, thank you for that, Hildy. Um, as mentioned, my name is uh, Bill Barrett. I'm an inspector with the uh, Brooklyn Park Police Department. And I wanna talk with uh, everyone today about a uh, project that we worked on and give a little history about Brooklyn Park and our agency on what we've done with collaborating with communities, and more importantly, talk to you about a uh, recent research project that we just got done uh, implementing back in October of 2016 called Brooklyn Park Act. Give you a little history about Brooklyn Park. Um, for those of you that might not know, we are the sixth largest city in the state of Minnesota. Our city encompasses about 26 and a half square miles, and we have a resident population of about 78,000 people. Um, our agency averages over 70,000 police calls for service each year, and our authorized sworn officer strength is at 108. What's really interesting about, uh, about our community here in Brooklyn Park, as you can see on the uh, slide in front of you here, is that one in four of our residents speak a language other than English. 52% are non-white, and 20% are immigrants or foreign-born. Some other interesting uh, information about uh, Brooklyn Park is um, Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, no relation to our city, we're just neighboring agencies next to one another. We have the highest concentrations of Liberians outside of the Republic of Liberia, and it's estimated that about 10% of all of Brooklyn Park's residents are of Liberian descent. The graph that I want to show everybody here today, um, demographic changes, is something that our city had undergone over a 10-year period. As you can see, going back to uh, 2000, a majority of our population, our resident population here in Brooklyn Park was 70% uh, white or Caucasian. And then by 2010, 
that uh, percentage had dropped to 50% uh, white or Caucasian. In 2015, we are now at 48%. So we are a very diverse community and it's changing um, year after year after year. The other slide I wanted to show too is one unique thing about Brooklyn Park, and this might not be unique to our city. I'm sure this is like this with many other jurisdictions and communities out there across the United States is, is our city is viewed as two separate cities. Um, the image that you're looking at here today is kind of a breakdown of household, average household incomes. And the reason that I wanted to show this is that we have got a high concentration um, of single family apartments and low income families living in the southern part of our city. Where the, where the northern part of our city is a lot more newer buildings and um, single family homes that have come up during this 10 year span. So to put, the, put, put, put this into perspective and talk about uh, why we as an agency here in Brooklyn Park uh, began to create a bunch of new initiatives, I gotta take you back to 2007. And this graph that I'm showing you here today is depicting, uh, there's actually two different things here. I want you to focus on the purple line. Uh, but if you look at that, going back in 2007, our crime actually took, hit its highest point that we've ever experienced here in the city. And we noticed that the incline and increase of crimes really began going back to 2003, 2004, where it spiked in 2007. And this was during the same time that our city was diversifying very rapidly. The bottom two lines that you're looking at there are actually what's, what is what we uh, coded as our crime concentration, a 25% and 50% crime concentration. But I'm gonna talk to that about that in a couple of upcoming slides as we move forward. So what we did going back in 2007, our agency in collaboration with our city, including the city council and the mayor and other community groups and church leaders um, in, our, in our city, thought that it would be best for the police department to develop and implement other programs, initiatives, and specialized units to engage and build trust with our rapidly diversifying community. And um, what I put on here was some examples of some of these specialized units and programs and initiatives that we here did in Brooklyn Park. Some of this might not be unique to Brooklyn Park, um, as I know a lot of agencies you know, in the United States have certain divisions like this, but what I want you guys to focus on is what, what I've documented down towards the bottom here, and I'll cover that here in just a second. But we do have a, a community-oriented policing unit, which we call our COPS unit. Back in 2007, we created what was called a CREW unit, our community response unit. And this was a unit made up of specialized officers who had additional training in mental health and um, juvenile relations, and they worked with the community because juvenile crime in our city even spiked higher in 2009. Um, we have crime prevention specialists, we have school resource officers. But what we did here in the city, and, and this is what I think was new and it was definitely innovative at the time, was the creation of a community liaison. This is a civilian position within our department that actually would actually work with different community leaders from diff different ethnic backgrounds um, in our city. Uh, I mentioned the juvenile unit and the crew unit. Um, due to the juvenile crime impact that our city experienced in 2009, we created another initiative and a program called YVPI, the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative. And we opened up a center called the Zanewood Rec Center. And this was a place for juveniles to come after school. Clearly this was a, a collaborative effort um, amongst the city, all city officials, church groups, and the three independent school districts that uh, encompass uh, locations within the city of Brooklyn Park. We also created the MAC Committee, which is our Multicultural Advisory Committee. We pushed out neighborhood action plans and neighborhood advisory bullet bulletins to our residents within these communities. The creation of the Brooklyn Park Human Rights Commission. And ultimately what I wanna to talk to you today about is the Brooklyn Park Act model. And I don't wanna sound arrogant in any way, but those who are tuned in and listening here today, I really want you to pay attention to ACT because what I can tell you is, is this was a program that worked for us and I can see it working for a lot of different agencies um, who are looking to do collaborative efforts within their community. I've included a couple other photos that I wanted to share with everyone here. Um, the individuals in blue are all police department personnel and this is a uh, Liberian women's cook, uh, kickball league that our police department um, has been participating with with our females in the Liberian community for several years now. 
And we also do what's called a Cops and Kids Fishing Tournament, and this began back in 2009. We're going into our ninth year um, with this program this upcoming summer, and this is where we're engaging uh, at-risk youth. This has been a uh, real hit within the community. So what we're really talking about here is communicate and engaging. And um, you know, when I talk about um, the goal of this collaborative effort of the ACT program, it re really was to develop, implement, and evaluate a new approach to collective efficacy hotspots policing that will end up fostering a sense of belonging in transient and marginalized communities through regular police patrols. You know, the goals of this uh, program act that I'm gonna to explain to you, to you here today was to further aim and reduce crime by helping residents trust and collaborate with one another, as well as better engage with the police. So instead of us, the police, solving problems for the community, we're gonna have the residents um, take on a more proactive role by taking responsibility for prevention and fighting crime with support from the police. And how do we do that? That's done through collaboration, communication, and engaging the community. So touching on ACT, um, assets coming together to take action, kind of a little project background here for everybody. Um, this initial conversation came up with our former police chief, Michael Davis, and Professor David Weisberg back in 2012, and it was discussed at the uh, Harvard Executive Session on Police and Public Safety. Um, through a partnership with GMU, the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy at George Mason University, we were awarded a grant through SBI and the Bureau of Justice Assistance back in the winter of 2013. And the goal of the study was to develop and test an innovative hotspots policing program that helps patrol officers build collective efficacy. And for those of you that don't understand what collective efficacy is, that is the willingness of others or individuals to intervene on behalf of the common good. And this was gonna be done at high crime locations. And here's the key that this project really encompassed. This was gonna be done by patrol officers, not specialized units within our department during their discretionary time. And we were hoping that it would ultimately reduce crime while helping residents trust and better engage with one another and ultimately the police. You can kind of see on here, this was a, a three-year project. Um, it was a lot of work, uh, but the outcome of it was, uh, was very promising and rewarding for our community and the citizens who, uh, who we had interactions with. Um, so when I talk about ACT and building collective efficacy, I'm really talking about three key components. And again, this was all done at the patrol officer level. Um, the support of the ACT program, when I talk about collaboration and kind of touch on what Hildy had mentioned earlier today, I can tell everybody that our ACT program really encompassed the seven key principles that Hildy spoke about. Um, you know, especially principle number one, strong leadership. We had to have that with our community um, at the level of our city, what we call city hall, um, council, the mayor, police administration, all the way down to our sergeants to promote and encourage this model. Um, but the officers, as you can see here, had to identify what we called asset identification. And this was really something that the officers were empowered to do. Um, you know, they had people that were there to help um, some of our crime analysts, some of our cops officers, access to records management. But they were given a treatment area that we called. And each treatment area was assigned to patrol officers. And those patrol officers owned that treatment area for the entire 16 months during this implementation. And the goal of the asset identification was to, was to identify assets, you know, community members, residents, stakeholders, identify possible liabilities, um, anchor points, locations, um, learn everything that they can learn about their treatment area. Once that was done, it was really up to the patrol officers to bring everybody together and build these collaborations between the residents to enhance these informal social controls and to identify neighborhood concerns and develop solutions. And I, and I really wanna to touch on this because I think in policing, and I've been around the block for a long time, I think we in the police are at fault to the degree of we are good at telling people what their problems are, what problems they're experiencing in their community. And I can tell you after working on the ACT project for three and a half years, um, we couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, just because we know that there's a lot of crimes happening in the community does not um, mean that that is the problems that the residents are experiencing who live in those communities. And the only way that we were able to identify that was to reach out and make 
routine contact with these residents to build trust and relationships and finally start to understand what mattered to them, what concerns they had about livability. Um, and then once those were all identified, it was up to the officers and the community, the residents, to come together, come up with solutions um, while maintaining their relationships and, and, and taking action and moving forward. So we say why hotspots? Um, you know, Professor Weisberg, um, who we worked with, who I have a lot of respect for, um, and through our research partners at George Mason University, they were able to identify something that we as an agency did not. And um, we have very good crime analysts, but one thing that was learned when we looked at all of our crime data from 2011 to 2013 was that our crime was highly concentrated. And what I mean by that is Brooklyn Park roughly has 3,100 street segments encompassing our entire city. And when we looked at all of our crime, we identified that 50% of our crime occurs at only 2.1% of those 3,100 street segments, or roughly 64 streets. And to break that concentration down even more, 25% of crime year after year after year occurs at 0.4% of those 3,100 street segments, or roughly 14 streets. So one would ask, why are we not focusing our efforts in these 65 to 80 streets that are causing 80% of the crime um, within our communities. So the implementation of ACT began. Uh, we, we implemented treatment in 21 areas um, that were going to receive the um, relationship building and engagement with our officers. We also had 21 controlled groups that were out there. The controlled groups were not known to the police officers. They were only told to do their treatment, and, and the treatment that I'm talking about is what they learned through their training and our partnerships with George Mason University, SPI, um, our Smart Matter experts, um, Dr. Craig Uchida, who was mentioned earlier, and Shelly Solomon with Justice, uh, Justice Strategies and Securities. Um, the training was crucial to this, and working with that and imposing this onto our officers, they were able to... Um, move forward this ACT model in their, in their treatment areas. I'm gonna show a couple examples here, one of which is what we called uh, the 84th Avenue duplexes. The officers assigned to this one in particular, Officer Derek Zeeland, um, he didn't like the term assets, and that's not a term that we used uh, with the community members. That was a term that we used in-house. It was just identifying um, who would be assets in the community, but he actually solicited and told the residents that he is looking for ambassadors. And, um, you know, to kind of speed this along and, and explain this here, some of the things that were done in this treatment area um, were nothing short of astonishing. Um, and this was done with the work of Officer Derek Zeeland and his partner, Matias Gomez, um, by routinely going out, knocking on doors, making contacts, building relationships um, with the residents who lived in this community. And, and what I want to stress here is this has always been a high crime area. Um, a lot of crimes, but what we found out is that what we perceived as the crimes were really not the problems in which the community was facing there. Um, the officers and the residents worked together um, and the residents created a Facebook page for everybody on that block. Everybody had access to it. They invited the two officers into it. The police officers shared their work cell phones with the residents and residents would text routinely these officers, whether they were working or not working, and the officers would respond back they identified some of the concerns, came up with some action plans. And uh, even though the implementation uh, phase of this project had ended in October of 2016, these two officers still have relationships with the residents in this community. And ironically speaking, so far moving into 2017, we've had zero crimes in this area. And during the implementation, we watched crime drop about 74% during the implementation of this program. So moving on, uh, this is just another example of a treatment area that we call Strawberry Commons. Um, this was actually a condominium complex. This was a little bit different than single family homes. As you can see here, 40% were owners, 60% were renters. Um, officers were, were able to work with several residents to identify some of the issues that were going on there. Again, a lot of the issues were not crime related. They were more livability. They were more lighting issues. They were code enforcement issues. But a lot of neighborhood meetings were held with these residents and it brought everybody together where they all understood that they're all sharing the same concerns and that really helped move the, uh, move the program along. So where we are today, you know, at the end of uh, October of 2016, 
I wanted to put the screen up here to show everybody. Um, 16 months of implementation by 44 patrol officers in 21 treatment areas. Our officers logged 1,920 hours of time in their treatment areas. That breaks down to 115,200 minutes. Um, you can see 647 hours were contact with residents. 747 hours were spent doing extra patrols and foot patrols. Um, 172 hours of resident meet and greets, which was kind of small, maybe a couple families getting together, meeting with the patrol officers. Um, 21 hours of large community meetings and 40 hours of smaller community, community meetings. This was a large project, but the outcome was, uh, was very rewarding, not only for the community, but for the officers who, uh, who worked on the project. And I've included a couple photos here. This was some of the community trainings that went on later. Um, into the program where we invited some of the community members up to meet with the officers and uh, our smart matter experts to kind of talk about how we continue this, how we move forward, um, continuing this collaboration with, with the residents where we're empowering themselves to kind of take on the role of being a sentinel um, and, and serving their community. Um, kind of a breakdown here, some, some notes that were taken during the whiteboard during one of those uh, community police training sessions. Um, you know, showing more photos, showing that our officers are encouraged to get out of their patrol cars um, and engage the youth within our community. Um, this here are some photos of the, another treatment area that was done. Uh, a lot of the kids, believe it or not, in this large townhome complex would not play with one another. There's a couple parks there. Parks were usually empty a lot. Uh, there was some crime. Uh, we worked with management, worked with the residents, held community meetings, learned that uh, a lot of the residents were concerned that there was a lack of um, security on the property, um, that there was a lot of trash and stuff going on. So the officers and the community you know, thought it'd be a good idea to uh, invite all the kids and parents to come out and do a trash pickup day. And um, after that was all done, uh, we provided ice cream to the kids and uh, it was actually a very good community police outreach program. And I'm proud to state that even today, a lot of these kids are uh, picking up trash within their own community um, and asking um, for the officers to come back out again and uh, maybe engage in some other different type of activity. And just kind of another shot of what happened here. So I thank you for your time. Um, I've got my information on here. If anybody's got any questions, uh, you're more than welcome to email me or call me. Other than that, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Sandra, for these terrific examples of collaborative policing. We now want to give the people in the audience an opportunity to ask questions and to engage themselves. Um, we hope you'll spend an additional five or ten minutes past the hour to uh, for this Q&A. So, Zoe, have there been any questions um, in the chat function that you can ask? Hi, Hildy. Um, there was a question submitted in advance of the webinar that um, I can throw out there. So um, someone had inquired about what sort of funding might be available to support these sorts of initiatives. And I believe that Kate might have said she was willing to uh, speak to that issue. Uh, yes, I am. Um, can you hear me, Zoe? Yes. Great. Um, there are a number of opportunities that you can look to um, in terms of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our relevant programs. Um, you know, the most obvious ones are actually present today on, on this webinar, um, the Smart Policing Initiative, which uh, that solicitation for FY17 has closed already. It closed at the end of January, uh, but uh, we are uh, presuming that will be available also next year, um, dependent on the availability of appropriations. Uh, and that is, you know, how we, we, we supported Brooklyn Park um, in pursuing their initiative. Uh, secondly, and I think co the, the concept of, of, of community engagement and multi-sector collaboration and collective efficacy is very much at home in the Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Program. Um, we over in smart policing have learned a tremendous amount about um, effective collaboration techniques because you know BCJI just really does invest in, in the development um, of those partnerships 
uh, those place-based approaches um, you know, through, through its funding. And both of these can be explored in greater detail at uh, our website, uh, bja.gov, um, and you can look under funding opportunities, and you can also look under the programs tab. Um, there is also the possibility of uh, seeking out private funding, such as uh, the Arnold Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation. Um, both of those entities have taken a, a serious interest in supporting um, you know, more effective crime intervention, crime reduction, um, police community um, collaboration initiatives um, at the state and local level. Uh, so th th those are my, my best tips at this point, and I'm more than happy to um, confer with anyone one-on-one -on -one, um, should they have particular ideas um, and to brainstorm where else they can seek out support. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we just had a question come in on the chat for Bill. Uh, Bill's person asks, uh, you mentioned that communication and engagement were key in the implementation of the initiatives in Brooklyn Park. Could you elaborate a little more on the types of communication that were the most effective? For example, quality, frequency, problem solving, timeliness, and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, it's hard to get this whole program out in a, uh, in, in a short webinar. Um, but the communication was really something when, you know, when I, when I talked about officers doing this during the discretionary time, there's different avenues or tools for communication other than uh, voicemails and phone calls. Uh, a lot of it was done through social media. Um, some of it was done through text messaging. Um, but the main focus of the communication was in-person contact. And this was something that each officer would, uh, would stop out in their treatment area once or twice a week. So that area would, would be visited um, on a minimum of, of four times a week, um, anywhere from 10, 10 minutes to 30 minutes um, at a time. Um, just to let them know, and, and, and this is it was kind of a new approach because it was different for the officers because they're going to an area to do something um, when there's no crime. Um, they're doing what some of the specialized units in our agency had done, so it was kind of new to them. But um, once the ice was kind of broke, if you want to use that analogy, uh, they found it very, uh, very comforting. Um, it really got to the degree in many of our treatment areas that the residents would no longer refer to the officer as Officer Smith. It was, hey, John, how you doing? How was your weekend? Um, and that was the relationships that were built. So it was very frequent. Um, it happened quite a bit. And then if something came up, uh, the residents were encouraged that you can always reach out to the officers by sending them a, a voicemail or an email. And a lot of the officers um, received text messages and they would text these community members um, back and forth, um, even when they were on days off and they weren't working. Thanks, Bill. Um, Maria Fryer from BJ just jumped on the chat to remind uh, all of us and Kate that um, the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program is also an opportunity if you are looking at collaboration related to mental health related issues and that uh, solicitation is open until April 4th. Um, we have another question, this could be for any of our panelists, um, asking about how can you engage with a community characterized by significant apathy and distrust of any official agency or agent, especially when um, considering how to engage with community leaders. So maybe, Hildy, you could start that off and then maybe pass it off to one of the other panelists. Well, I think uh, we probably uh, see this a lot where you have an, uh, a community with a lot of people that um, uh, are, are very stressed, dealing with a lot of personal uh, issues and so they're very apathetic in terms of getting involved. And so it takes, I think, a, a lot of um, the things that Bill just mentioned, um, officers who want to establish positive relationships in those kind of communities need to spend some time there, uh, be seen on a frequent basis, get to know people as individuals, begin communicating, um, whether it's just taking a minute or two to talk to people, um, having um, coffee with the COP programs um, and uh, uh, playing, um, participating in sports activities, uh, letting the people see that they can interact positively with officers, not just see them when it's a, a negative situation. All of those things will uh, begin to sort of turn around that attitude, that apathetic attitude, 
and um, begin to see some positive relationships forming. So I'm wondering if Sandra or Bill, do you have a, some ideas to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, Bill here, I, this, was, this was actually a really good question, and, and I'm glad somebody asked it because um, when we were going through building the ACT model, um, and we, we tried to identify all possible barriers and challenges that we were going to experience in, in building relationships with our community members, and, and really what I want to push here is we're trying to build these relationships in our highest crime areas. Um, how do we do that? And developing, um, you know, project goals and, and training practices and providing information to our officers. And then all of a sudden, Ferguson happens and Baltimore happens. And here in Minnesota, Jamar Clark, Philandro Castile happens. Um, you talk about some barriers being thrown up and a lot of distrust for the police. But what I will tell you, and I saw it firsthand because this is what we pushed all the way down with our sergeants to our officers was repetition, do not give up. Um, keep going out, keep building those relationships, keep showing your face, humanize the police, build trust, build legitimacy, and that can only be done through genuine, honest relationships with the residents. And because of those relationships in these high crime areas, because of a reduction of crime in Brooklyn Park in these high crime areas, um, the perception of crime lowering um, trust in the police gathering better. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that they trust everybody in Brooklyn Park Police, but these residents who resided in these communities definitely trusted those two officers. Um, they would work out and they would actually talk to them about what the national media was showing and, and, and try to communicate and educate with the residents. So I think the best thing is, is repetition. Now, did we get to everybody? Absolutely not. Um, there were some people that we could not get to, but I will tell you, a majority of them um, that lived in these micro communities, we already had relationships with them and trust with them. And they were able to at least view, well, Brooklyn Park's not like these other agencies. And we're able to identify that, you know what, not all police are like this or bad things happen with police all over the country. Because I know these Brooklyn Park officers, they're good people. I trust them. They invite them over for dinner, invite them over for barbecues in the summertime. Um, you know, but it's all through repetition. So I hope that helps. And Hildy, if I can just jump in, this is Sandra. Um, this sure. is actually something that we experienced um, in the beginning stages, stages of the BCJI grant in San Bernardino. Um, the target area of the BCJI grant was one that had been uh, targeted in the past by various different weed and seed programs that, have, that came and left. And when they were there, um, you know, crime went down, but as soon as you pulled the enforcement away, then crime went up. And so um, in addition to that, a lot of the residents had been previously surveyed. Um, and so, you know, when we were going out conducting a door-to-door -door survey, we were very careful, um, you know, in doing that. And we partnered with a faith-based um, organization from the area um, because we learned that they were already present in the community. And so rather than um, us starting from scratch, we kind of figured out who who are the people that or the entities that the residents um, trust and how can we partner to, to get additional information from them and also at the same time be sensitive to their needs, meet them at their place, and, um, and then also have, you know, those conversations with them about how is this project different. And I think, you know, as Bill was saying, you know, just kind of being there and just not giving up, I think that was something that we did as part of the BCJI program. We, we were constantly there, and um, we were, you know, they had cell phone numbers. They, they were texting. Um, you know, they didn't feel comfortable reporting a crime to the police, and they felt comfortable reporting it to us, and so we, were, we would be the middle person until they felt comfortable. Um, and that was very key to us um, because I think one of the things that they felt is, okay, well, you know, as soon as this project ends, then um, everything that we worked for is going to go away. And I, and, and I think that by the fact that one of the cross-sector partners kind of like stepped up to, to the plate and said, you know what, we're going to continue investing in this because we want to see this project through, that brought additional um, – assurance to the residents that this project is not the same as previous projects. Thank you, Sandra. Zoe, is there one more question we could take? 
Uh, yeah, we do have one, a uh, couple more. So um, one for um, Inspector Barrett uh, asking about how is the challenge of the language barrier handled in Brooklyn Park? <clears throat> Yeah, so there's there's obviously a language barrier. So when we identified the communities on the front end, um, you know, we have a a mixture of different cultures in our city, and if we ran across um, non English speaking residents, we would try to assign ahead of time. If we knew that the population was mostly uh, Hmong or mostly Spanish, we would try to put those officers that were able to speak one of those other languages in that treatment area. Um, otherwise, we use uh, other services like a um, English speaking line. It's, it's a service that we call that can do some translations. Or we would identify. This this happened quite a bit. Uh, we would identify somebody in the community that would that could speak both languages, and they would be able to interpret. Um, that kind of came, um, you know, a few months into the implementation after some of the relationships were built and people were identified. But all of that fell under that initial asset identification. When, it, when I mean identifying assets, it's identifying who they are. Um, you know, what is their role in the community? Um, do they have one? And are they willing to engage and help out and, and be a partner in this project um, and help bring others together? And it was during that phase that we were identify, you know, able to identify those others who were able to speak. So, you know, whether it was through that or it was through the officer's ability to uh, translate, um, we, that, that really was not a barrier that we had to worry about. Great, and then we have a question about um, measuring um, the success of collaboration. So the question is, what are the primary ways to measure successful implementation with community collaboration? You know, I don't want to take up all the time here, but um, you know, when we did our ACT model prior to the implementation, um, a portion of this or a product of this uh, of this grant was to do uh, preliminary surveys in both the treatment and control groups. And this was uh, voluntary surveys, and each one of those surveys were about 30 minutes where we hired independent researchers outside of uh, the police department that were hired by our research partners that went into these uh, communities, our controlled and treatment areas, and conducted a plethora of surveys and kind of got a baseline. Uh, we then did the implementation, and, and, and literally as I speak mm -hmm. now, surveys are about halfway done, the post surveys. So kind of the same thing, um, surveys are go surveyors are going back out into these communities, the treatment and controlled, and they're, they're taking surveys again. And it's kind of a way to gauge, um, you know, trust, legitimacy, uh, perceptions of fear, livability, uh, victimization um, with the residents to see if those treatment areas actually had an impact um, from the work that the officers did other than just hotspots policing to deter crime. And if I can just add, um, so, I, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to complete the BCJI program. Um, so I actually left um, prior to the completion of the part of the NTC to kind of um, ensure that we are successful as a cross-sector partnership is um, we're developing a, uh, a transformation plan um, that uh, is uh, founded on the seven priority areas that were identified by the community. And um, we are partnering up with uh, Loma Linda University um, to help us identify population level change for each of the different priority areas. And as part of that, we are also working towards getting um, all of the leaders of the community, um, different sectors to the table to ensure that there is buy-in and coordination on, um, on this transformation plan that we hope will be kind of like a blueprint of what needs to happen um, within the next five years in order for us to be able to measure success in the uh, seven priority areas of the community. Great, thank you both for your answers on that. Um, so I think we're going to take this one last question, which happens to tie in very closely with our smart policing principle of sustainability. Um, this question asks, uh, residents often express concerns about grant programs coming to an end. So um, in the Brooklyn Park or also in the San Bernardino experience, was the implementation um, where the, you know, officer and personnel time um, covered by grant funds? And then if they were, how have um, your sites managed to continue? these engagements beyond that initial implementation period. 
Well, Bill here, you know, I can speak to the fact that, um, you know, yeah, the grant is over. We're in the uh, the analysis and assessment phase of, uh, of the work that the patrol officers did. But uh, to try to reiterate um, what I had talked about earlier, uh, a lot of these areas, um, these officers developed genuine relationships with these residents. And just because the grant went away, um, those relationships have not. Um, still to this day, um, these officers who are working in these uh, treatment areas that we're called are still maintaining relationships with these residents. And, um, you know, we, we continue the implementation on for an additional four months. Um, the impact to our agency, we've got the model built. Um, this is something that uh, we have support when I talk about collaboration um, amongst the city and the council and the mayor and the community um, in our police department all the way through the leadership. Uh, we encourage this type of policing, this innovative, you know, what I call uh, community engagement 2.0. Um, it's hard to end a relationship with somebody when, you, when you've had it for 16 months and, and everybody's been humanized. Uh, the police know that these officers know that most of these residents live in these communities are good people. Um, and it kind of subsided some of the perception that even the police have going, oh, that's just a high crime area, everybody's drug dealers and whatever, they're not. And the community members there have a legitimate trust in these officers and, and, and they've maintained those relationships. And we as an agency here in Brooklyn Park are going to continue this collective efficacy model moving forward. Uh, we probably won't do it in such a large scale as 21 treatment areas, but we are gonna target seven to 10 as I've got about 20 patrol officers that want to continue this type of community engagement um, in this ACT model moving forward. Um, they see the benefits of it. They enjoy that type of police work. They enjoy building these relationships. And more importantly, it's just a different way of policing. Um, there's a lot of benefits to it. It, you know, it. it makes our community safer. It makes our police officers feel safer, especially when they're rewarded with seeing the residents in these communities helping them out now and, and, and calling 911 and acting as witnesses or sharing information and um, you know caring about them as a person, not just as a police officer. Um, it's, it's very rewarding and it's beneficial to everybody. Thank you. I'm going to now um, wrap this up. We're about almost 20 minutes past the hour. I really appreciate everyone in the audience who is stayed with us and continue to be interested and wrapped by this discussion, which has been just super. And let me say thank you to uh, our presenters and Jason Cooper and Sandra and Bill from these successful collaboration sites. We really appreciated your participation today, your honesty and openness about what you're doing. And uh, Thank you to everybody in the, uh, in the audience for participating with us. I just wanted to mention one last thing, that you can get a copy of our Smart Policing Collaboration Principles that I described early in the webinar uh, online at the um, link you see on the screen. We would also appreciate you uh, completing a webinar evaluation that will come to you immediately following the webinar. and. Um, we hope that you will participate with us in the future and uh, we will be offering more information and more tools on collaborative policing in the future. So uh, thank you so much for your attention today. We really appreciate it.